media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Chris Sims, BC Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, her website, Taxpayer.com. Welcome back to the show, Chris. Great to be here. Chris, uh, we have the scandal involving the Governor General, who I guess officially hasn't been told why she resigned but we all know there's a a damning report not only did she apparently verbally abuse staff she actually uh, physically abused staff yeah we're reading these allegations and it's very concerning and you want to distress you know their allegations at this point but yeah apparently according to these reports it got physical so that's you know I don't remember ever being in an office situation let alone in the mansion of the governor general where something that extreme would happen and what I find very telling, just personally speaking, uh, I worked in Ottawa for a long time and have had the great privilege of actually being in Rideau Hall quite a few times because that's where they will have uh, medals of valor given out for people who, you know, are very brave and save each other, uh, military awards, things like that, and, of course, cabinet shuffles. And so I've been in the building a lot. It's opulent. It's beautiful. And if you are a political kind of government policy monarchy type nerd if you're that type of a bureaucrat that's your dream job if you get to work at Rideau Hall with the governor general that is like that is your aim and what's interesting is how many people quit like people were quitting and going on sick leave in droves from that workplace ever since she was named the governor general so that should have been a big red flag for people and it's strange that it went on this long um, and we need to stress by the very fact that she is no longer Governor General, that automatically qualifies her for a lifetime pension. She'll get about $150,000 per year and expenses for life of up to $200,000 a year of office expenses, admin expenses, anything like that. So we're on the hook for a lot of money here. Well, Adrian Clarkson was kind of... Uh, famous for billing us for everything, you know, 50 bucks for an envelope. And, you yes, know, little, exactly. Right, so uh, she was trying to be the queen herself. Uh, Julie, of course, so should there be a committee? And, and what's more, I want to know, do we really need governor generals and uh, lieutenant uh, governors uh, in the provinces very costly? Because it's not just their salary. And their clothing and pomp and everything, but they have staffs, they have residents, residences. How much is this costing taxpayers? And could we just not have, say, one representative of the Queen who works right across Canada? That's a great question. Uh, so to break it down, we are in a constitutional monarchy. Uh, as most people listening probably know, I hope, uh, Her Majesty the Queen is our head of state. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is not. So that's what makes us different from a republic, for example. So U.S. President Joe Biden is their head of state, whereas up here, it's actually Her Majesty the Queen. And in order to get laws passed, they are given, literally it's called, royal assent. When it's finished in the Senate, they hand it to the Governor General, who basically is a stand-in, a representation of the Queen here in Canada. And so we need that function if we want to remain a uh, a constitutional monarchy and not change our entire system of government over to a republic, but you really hit the nail on the head. Do we need it to be this fancy? Do we need to be spending, it must be well over, you know, a million dollars every single year uh, on this? Do they need all this staff? Do they need to live in mansions? Uh, Can this be more of a part-time gig for, you know, a respected uh, superior court justice, for example? Because right now, of course, we need somebody to stand in for the governor general or we literally can't get laws changed. 
And so right now there is a Supreme Court justice that is pinch hitting. And so they do need to do some things that are important. They need to actually, they're supposed to anyway, read the legislation, think about it, weigh it against our current legislation, and then sign off on it. And then apart from that, it's a lot of the ceremonial pomp and circumstance, the the easy stuff that you can just basically read your protocol book and do. So yeah, you raise a very good point. Could we simply get the Governor General to do all of this for all the different provinces? But then would that also incur more travel time because they need to physically be there in order to review things or read the throne speeches? It's it's a great question. Um, it's something that we're calling for a review of. We think that this does not need to cost taxpayers so much money. The Chief Justice of the B.C. Court of Appeal could do it. Exactly. They're, they've already, it's very similar actually. The way that courts rule and the way they function is very similar to how Parliament functions. They, they're they're two parts of the same machine, really. And they have to already swear an oath to Her Majesty the Queen. Of course you do, because you are literally representing the Crown. And that's, we're already paying them. Exactly. And that that that's already covered, right? And they're already good legal minds, we hope. And they're used to, used to interpreting uh, parliamentary uh, law. So, yeah, that's a great question. Maybe they could simply have that extra duty and we could pay them a stipend instead of millions and millions of dollars every year. And again, it's these perks that this former governor general will get, and not just her, like you said, Adrian Clarkson, that really galls people. Adrian Clarkson's so-called office expenses have totaled more than a million dollars so far. That's after she left Rideau Hall. It's just wrong. And she also got millions of dollars to start up a foundation. You know, why are average hardworking taxpayers footing these crazy ritzy bills? It's just not fair. We'll have more with Chris Sims right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Chris Sims. Chris, I see BC telling people they're going to get a break on their rates starting in May. Is it a, a decent break? And should they be, or shouldn't people who pay for BC's monopoly government run insurance company already be getting a rebate because there's fewer accidents with less business on the roads? This was just some of the silliest announcements that we'd seen out of ICBC in a while, and that's saying something. Uh, so one, they've put up this weird rate calculator on their website where you get to go to it and punch in all your data and like, ooh, coming up soon in the spring, this is how much money you could be saving or should be saving. That's super weird because calculators of those sort are used for people who are shopping around. So if you're sitting there with your spouse on the couch at night and you're shopping around for, you know, a better credit card with interest rate or a new car or maybe even home if you're lucky to be able to afford one here in BC, um, that's where you use those calculators. Look, honey, you know, this is what our payments would be. Okay, well, with this bank or this insurance company, this is what this would be. With, with ICBC, there's no shopping. It is a mandatory government force monopoly. So it's super weird that they spent time and money creating this little calculator. It's like a gimmick. And so we're, we're going to file freedom of information requests to find out how much ratepayers spent on this completely meaningless calculator. And to your point on rebates, yeah, we BC drivers are the last in Canada to be getting our rebates. We should have gotten these rebates at the same time that other drivers did across Canada. And, of course, that happened during the spring when COVID was at its absolute worst and people were locked down. Many people, unfortunately, had actually lost their jobs. Others, you know, just couldn't go into work. And so there were fewer vehicles on the road. Ergo, there were fewer crashes. And so the costs to ICBC went down. They saved money. 
but they should have passed those savings on to us, the customers, the ratepayers who weren't out in our vehicles. That's what other companies did. And in some cases, it was hundreds of dollars. And they also did it automatically. They just debited it back in their accounts or sent them a check automatically. Here, we're still waiting. It's nine months since the other people got their rebates. So it's really odd. It's not fair. How much do you think uh, British Columbians would have received? Do you know what the average rebate was across the country? Yeah, the average rebate, uh, if I recall correctly, was about $265 each. And in some cases, it was over $300. So, like, it's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, that would have come in really handy for a lot of folks and families before Christmas, you know, um, that would cover a hydro bill for most homes. You know, that's that's real dough. And so they should have sent that to them already. Just speaking anecdotally, I was speaking with a friend of mine back in the spring, and we were, you know, both fretting on how to save money because things were just, you know, going to hell in a handbasket. And she's in Ontario. And she actually forgot, even though I work in, in this industry, she actually forgot that we don't have driving choice out here. We don't have, we can't shop around. She said, oh, if you're looking to save money, just contact your insurance provider. Mine already gave me backdated 15% per month, backdated three months. They just automatically deposited my account. It was great. You should give yours a call. <laughs> Do you forget that we're out here and there's only ICBC? And so that's just one personal example. Uh, so, yeah, we should have gotten this months and months ago. Now, the B.C. government also promised during the election to give $500 to individuals, $1,000 to families to help them cope with the increased costs of the virus crisis. Many families still haven't received it. Do we know how much this program is costing to administer and what about the poor folks who live on the street who perhaps don't have a bank account to have that money deposited it in? Will they ever get that cash? That's a great question, uh, because in order to fill that out, uh, because we've had, you know, we have some senior citizens who phone me that think that I'm the tax lady to help them with their taxes, bless them. Um, and so I've tried to just walk them through it uh, without actually entering any data myself. And it's quite complicated. You need to write in all your T4s. You need to have your permanent address. You need to have your mailing address. And so, yeah, a lot of people uh, who are homeless, I, I don't know how they would be able to get that sort of a benefit. When it comes to stuff like this, we we don't really want uh, boutique, you know, cuts and tax credits and stuff. So if you do A, we will give you B or C. We find that weird. And so he campaigned on it. It was a campaign promise. We It isn't taxable, which is interesting, where CERB payments are. Uh, so if that's something he needed to fulfill, we understand. We really hope that that money is going towards good things. And frankly, so many people have lost so much money. And around 44% of British Columbians, last we checked, are within $200 per month of not being able to meet all their bills. So that's insolvency. So yeah, so that money will probably come in handy. We don't know yet how much it's costing to administer, but it's something we will find out. We'll have more with Chris Sims right after this. Value from success growth and discovery. Golden Arrow Resources is a well-funded gold copper exploration company with proven management and prospective properties in Chile, Argentina, and Paraguay. Golden Arrow trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange, symbol GRG, on Frankfurt, symbol G6A, and the OTCQB, symbol GARWF. For more information, visit us at goldenarrowresources.com or call Sean at 778-686-0135. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Chris Sims. Chris, a report suggests that or recommends that social media fall under strict government regulation can you trust the government to regulate what you say about the government? We're getting into dangerous territory here, aren't we? Uh, yeah, that was quite something to read that. We need to keep in mind that it starts with little things of taxing you for using Netflix or forcing, you know, some streaming service to provide Canadian content, even if people don't want to watch it, or forcing taxpayers to fork over a billion and a half dollars to the CBC, even though, you know, the national is viewed by fewer Canadians than some American podcasts are, for goodness sake. 
Um, so yeah, it starts there and then it starts getting into policing now is what we're, what it's being floated as. And so number one, I think a lot of people who have civil liberties on their minds would have trouble with that. But from a taxpayer perspective, uh, policing all that wouldn't be cheap. What are you going to do? Create an entire ministry of information and investigation for social media? Are they going to start, you know, tracking people down and sourcing them? Are these going to be like their own version of cyber cops that is controlled by the federal government? How much is that going to cost? Are they going to be have to be bilingual to qualify? Are they going to get pensions? Are they going to have their birthdays off? Like this just sounds crazy expensive. I mean, to put a point on it, this federal government can't even do their payroll software properly. They still haven't fixed the Phoenix payroll software computer system, which is simply the way that they pay their employees. Everybody from some, you know, desk jockey in Quebec to somebody working hard in the Coast Guard off of our West Coast here, they're all paid through the federal government technically, and they all use the software. And it's cost Canadians billions of dollars because they started it up when it wasn't ready. If they can't get that right... Can you imagine them trying to police our speech online and then track people down? It just sounds like an expensive nightmare. Well, we already have uh, civil laws in Canada. You can't libel or slander yeah. people. And you it, can't it, threaten them. Right. And if you do it on the Internet, that's no, some people seem to think, oh, I'm exempt from the current laws if I do it online. No, <laughs> there's just more evidence, folks. Yes, exactly. And that is a matter, again, <laughs> good point. We already have laws on the books for this stuff. And if you see something like that, if somebody is threatening you, you phone the police. But it's not something that you hope that the federal government eventually outlaws on your behalf down the road. Like, that's so odd. But there's a difference between having a vociferous argument and getting hurt feelings and actually having it cross over into, like you said, a slander, liable, physical threats, uh, intimidation actually is a term uh, within the criminal code as well. Um, so all of those things have had to pass a certain threshold. And our elected representatives that we put into office in Parliament wrote them that way. So that means that they all sat around in the committees, they had witnesses come forward, they would have been legal experts, they would have been police, they would have been possible past victims of crime, and then they would write the legislation based on that deep thinking. So the legislation is very carefully worded. That's already on the books. So that's a strange new world that we're venturing into here if the government starts going down this road. Apparently, $636 million was paid to high school students who yes. applied for the CERB. How okay. did that happen? Just wild. So first off, I know there is going to be a small percentage of teenagers who needed that money. Again, to give you a personal example, I have a friend. We've been friends for a long time. Bless her, she was working full-time since she was 15. She would finish high school, and then she would go to McDonald's and work from 3 till closing every day, full-time shifts, and she was helping her parents pay for their mortgage. They needed that money. That's probably really exceptional. The idea that we borrowed more than half a billion dollars to give to teenagers during the COVID shutdown, man, there's got to be some serious investigations here. Like those ministers and those MPs responsible for doling this out and those bureaucrats better get their backsides into committee and they need to be facing questions from parliamentarians as to where did this money go and why did you pay it out and was this actually needed? Because if that many teenagers needed half a billion dollars to be borrowed with interest during this crisis, then we've got bigger problems than we thought. Yeah, it's interesting, too. I mean, I know you were in favor of let's get that money out. We don't want a situation yeah. like the U.S. where, oh, it's a political football. Do we give them $1,000, $600? hung up forever. Yep. Yeah, and, and they may not get that money until sometime in the spring, if it ever happens at all. So it's good to help out those people. And speaking of aid, the B.C. government set aside a sizable amount of money to help small business. Most of it's sitting on the shelf why is that the case? Because businesses are going out of business every day. That's a good question. Um, I w I'd be curious to hear if there are small businesses out there who are going under or are really struggling and they applied for the aid and they just hit a big brick wall and heard nothing back, like phone me, email us, call your local radio station, uh, let them know, tell journalists, because that's a big story. 
not actually hearing it that much, that, you know, I applied for this and couldn't get it and it fell through the cracks and da-da-da-da. I've heard from people who are really struggling, but I ha- I haven't heard from people who are really struggling and applied for the aid and didn't get it. So I'm sure those cases are out there, uh, and frankly, we'd like to hear about it because that shows that they didn't do their rollout properly. Um, the optimist in me would like to think that the government set it aside, but that maybe not as many businesses actually needed it as they first estimated. And maybe they can simply put that back onto the budget and eventually balance it quicker. So we'd have to see. I'd really like to know. We're also hearing right across the country there's hundreds of millions of federal aid available to small businesses. Again, that money is untapped. Have they made it too difficult for a small business, which, again, doesn't have a a fleet Mm -hmm. or a phalanx of uh, lawyers and accountants to fill in all these very complicated applications. Great point. Yeah, they don't have a team of lobbyists and accountants, you know, just ready at the snap of the fingers, right? It's interesting. Uh, Some of our friends over at CFIB, uh, Canadian Federation for Independent Businesses, they're the ones who are really leading the charge on this. And reading some of their stories, it's quite eye-opening, apparently especially at the federal level. They've been trying to get help. They've been trying to get through these hoops, and it's just impossible for some of these small businesses because, as you point out regularly, a lot of these small businesses run on very tight margins, including restaurants. They don't have hours and hours and hours and tons of lawyers and accountants to get through this kind of red tape. And so when we see something as crazy as $600 million paid out to teenagers and yet we are still hearing from small businesses from coast to coast who said they haven't gotten the help they need, that's mind-boggling. Chris, uh, anything else you'd like to bring up today? I just wanted to stress uh, that governments only behave if we make them behave. And I know it's tough out there right now, and it can get really depressing following the news, but you've got to stay in the game, and you've got to stay involved, no matter what party you support, okay? We want accountable government. To give you an example... One of the head bureaucrats in the finance department, okay, just the other day, said out loud on like a report that there was no GST on the carbon tax. Of course there's GST on the carbon tax. It's been one of those weird things now for years of your tax on a tax. But this bureaucrat whose job it is to work with numbers, including the carbon tax, like didn't know. That's not acceptable. And so Anybody out there who wants more accountable government, uh, try to help us. Be the change. Be that good citizen. If you see something that is screwed up, you pick up that phone and you send that email to your MLA or MP. And you can go to our website and we've got tips and tricks on how to get your message across. Mainly it's be brief, be very clear with what you need, and be courteous. Those three things usually get good results. Yeah, saying please and thank you gets you a long way. Sure does. (laughs) Chris, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for caring. My guest has been Chris Sims, B.C. Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Her website, taxpayer.com. What's your email? My email is ksims, K-S-I-M-S, at taxpayer.com. I would love to hear from you. If you have any questions for Chris or any of our other guests, you can send them as well to info at HowStreet.com, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at Talk Digital Net. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.